Great. Uh, so I think Alan arrived. <laughs> Welcome, Alan. <laughs> we were a little nervous, but it's great that you're here. We invited you yesterday and you were available. So that's really amazing. And so again, that welcome. One exception to what I said <laughs> is one of a small number of exceptions. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So uh, let me let me introduce the speaker today. Welcome back, everybody. Today we are delighted to welcome Harvard Professor Alan Dershowitz once more. He joins us to discuss a deeply concerning issue, the search of anti-Semitism following the barbaric terrorist attacks by Hamas against Israel on October 7th. While one, while one might expect such events to evoke sympathy and compassion for the victims and unequivocal, unequivocal con condemnation for the, of the attackers, we have instead observed the rise in anti-Semitism, notably within American universities. So Alan has recently authored a book delving into this disconcerting <laughs> phenomenon. And he's here to share insights on the roots and the potential remedies for anti-Semitism on, co on college campuses. Welcome, Alan. Well, thank you. I've been very busy. On October 7th, I decided to drop my other projects and try to finish a book within two or three weeks called War Against the Jews, How to Stop the uh, Hamas uh, Barbarism. And I finished the book literally today. And so it'll be out in a, in a, in a few weeks. Um, and, Alan, Alan, can, can we, uh, Ivan, can we record, uh, if Alan is willing, are you recording this? Because I think there are yes, some large we, audience we, would be interested. Yeah, we are recording it. Sorry. Okay, great. Thank you. So it's important to remember that the anti-Semitic attacks on uh, Israel uh, began literally hours after the disclosure that Hamas had beheaded and burned to death and raped, uh, well before Israel fired a single shot. So the anti-Semitic attacks by 33 groups at Harvard and comparable groups at other universities and many professors and, and Jewish Voice for Peace, which isn't Jewish and thankfully doesn't have a voice and doesn't support peace. It's a, it's a pretend organization. Uh, but Jewish Voice for Peace, the National Lawyers Guild, which has uh, uh, groups on virtually every law school campus in America, uh, and, and many of the groups uh, and many faculty groups uh, began their anti-Semitic tirades against Israel well before Israel responded. Now, of course, they seek justification in Israel's uh, responses, uh, which we can talk about in a minute. But the, the, the virulent anti-Semitism began literally in response to the Hamas attacks. It's, it's an interesting phenomenon that uh, when Israel shows any weakness, when it is victimized, when 1,400 of its children and women and men and the elderly are, are murdered and, and, and 240 of them are, are kidnapped, that's when the anti-Semitism uh, is at its strongest. And I think you have to judge the anti-Semites uh, by when and what they said. Um, so groups of the kind I mentioned, the 33 groups at Harvard, some of which have now, uh, under pressure, retracted their, their statements, blaming the rapes and the beheadings on Israel. The National Lawyers Guild that hasn't retracted uh, any, anything. The Bronx defenders, these are people who defend poor people in the Bronx. Uh, what business they have commenting on the Middle East, I don't know, but they also uh, declared uh, Hamas's rapes and murders to be appropriate military responses, military responses to uh, an occupation, an occupation that ended in 2005, uh, essentially. Look, this is part of a long-term plan that um, I disclosed, I don't know, 20 years ago in a book I wrote called Why Terrorism Works, another book I wrote called the case for moral clarity. Hamas has a plan. It's brilliant and it works. It works every time. Um, and it gets worse and worse and worse because the media and the government and international organizations play into it. The plan is very simple. Um, they call it the CNN strategy. I call it the dead baby strategy. They will attack Israel, uh, kill as many civilians as possible, sometimes through rockets, sometimes through tunnels, sometimes through events of the kind we remember just three, three or four weeks ago. Uh, they will attack Israel, knowing full well that Israel will respond. They will then hide their attackers, their rockets, their commanders, 
um, uh, among civilians, uh, including babies and, and children, in the expectation, indeed, I would say the hope, that Israel's response, although targeting only uh, combatants, will inevitably cause collateral damage, and the result will be dead babies. And they're ready. They're ready. They're ready with their cameras. They're ready to bring out the dead babies, show them on television. CNN immediately cooperates. Uh, the United Nations cooperates. Uh, human rights so-called organizations cooperate. And they turn the blame to Israel. So it's, it's a win-win for Hamas. Hamas kills Israelis. Uh, then Israel gets blamed for that because Israel inevitably and accidentally and unintentionally kills civilians who were put in harm's way by, by Hamas. Uh, the Hamas, one of the Hamas leaders said yesterday, this is only the beginning. We will see October 7th repeated over and over again, and it will be repeated over again. Not only in Israel, it will be coming to a theater near you because it works. It works so effectively. Uh, you kill civilians, uh, the democracy like Israel responds, inevitably children die in the process because Hamas uses them as human shields. And then the entire moral issue and legal issue for some gets turned around and Israel loses in two ways. It loses by the civilians that it lost, as well as the soldiers. We're, we're up to 16 or 17 now. There'll be many, many more uh, lost. Uh, so Israel loses both ways. Hamas loses too, but Hamas defines losing differently. Uh, one of the Hamas leaders said, I quote him in one of my books, we love death like you love life. That's why we use our children, our women, our handicapped, our elderly as human shields. That's the plan. And as long as CNN and the United Nations and Human Rights Watch and, and faculty members at Stanford and Berkeley and Harvard and Yale and Columbia um, uh, play into this a strategy, it will continue. It will continue, it will never end because a successful strategy never ends. Uh, it's a success. Hamas doesn't care how many of its people die. Uh, they have a different definition of success and failure than Israel, the United States and other democracies do. So they are, a, willing to incur as many deaths and fatalities and injuries and, and, and other negative results among their fighters and soldiers. Of course, they hide their fighters and soldiers in tunnels. They give them all the protection. They do not permit civilians to come into the tunnels or get into bomb shelters quite deliberately because they want their civilians to die. So for Hamas, every death is a victory. An Israeli death is a victory, whether it's civilian or military. A Palestinian death is a victory, particularly if it's a civilian and a baby who can be trotted in front of television cameras. And even a military death is a victory. So it's very hard to fight against uh, a group of people who have almost no definition of, of losing. And that's why Israel finally, finally, it's long overdue. It, it was a mistake to wait this long, made the decision now, uh, finally, to try to rid um, Gaza of, of Hamas. They should have done it years ago before they were hostages. And they could have done it. And it would have taken, yes, collateral damage and the death of civilians. And it would have required Israel to bear it, um, to be condemned by the UN, to be condemned by the Human Rights Council. But as I've said before, Israel should never, ever, ever make a decision based on reaction by the international community. Yeah, sure, it has to listen to the United States, but it doesn't have to listen to the Secretary General of the United Nations who blamed all this on Israel. It doesn't have to listen to hypocritical uh, countries. And even when it comes to civilian deaths, morally, it certainly doesn't have to listen to the United States and Great Britain. Um, let's assume that Israel kills, let's assume that it kills 10,000, 15,000, 25,000, uh, 100,000 people in an effort to rid Gaza of, um, of Hamas. It won't kill that many. I hope it kills many, many fewer. But that pales in comparison to the number of civilian deaths in Afghanistan, the number of civilian deaths in Iraq. And, and these were done by Great Britain and the United States um, in an effort to prevent terrorists who were thousands of miles away from organizing. Yes, they had committed 9-11 
uh, which a fraction proportionately of the people killed on October 7th died. But they were not counting civilians. They were saying, we're going after uh, ISIS. We're going after Al-Qaeda. Uh, and, and we hope that civilians don't die. But they did. Hundreds of thousands of them died. I think the estimates in Iraq alone are between 270 and 320,000. So the United States has the power to lecture Israel. It doesn't have the moral authority to do it. When Winston Churchill and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, talked about total victory over Germany and Japan, that included the bombing of Dresden, the firebombing of Tokyo, and tragically the nuclear bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those were designed to save lives. Uh, you can debate and people will debate to the end of eternity whether or not it was necessary Sounds like, like he disconnected himself. Wait for I pressed the wrong button. Sorry I, about you, that. You're on mute. He, he's, on, he's here, but he's on mute. Ah, he, he muted himself. I don't see him. Alan, you're, oh. you're on mute. All right. Am I on mute? No, you're you on go. mute. Yeah, back great. Now. You're back. Yeah, now. Great. Thank you. So the United States should, uh, should continue to work closely together with Israel and try hard to together uh, minimize the number of civilian uh, casualties. But uh, let me give you a, a hypothetical. I've written about this extensively in some of my books. Um, let's assume that Iran is on the verge of developing a nuclear arsenal, and its imams have said they want to use the nuclear arsenal because Israel is a one-bomb state, and they want to destroy Israel. And the only way for Israel to destroy the atomic, uh, the, the nuclear facilities, the nuclear arsenal of, of Iran, is to attack the city of Tehran, and that's where they're burying their nuclear weapons, and to kill 10, 20,000 uh, people. The law of war permits that. Uh, what the law of war says is that you have to look at the value, the military value of the target, and the number of civilian deaths must be proportional to the value of the target. Now, who makes that decision? That decision is made by the country that is endangered by the military target. So Israel would be entitled to endanger many civilians in order to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. How many civilians are they entitled to endanger if the target is an important one, like a commander of Hamas or the commander who organized the uh, tragic events, the brutality of October 7th? Those are matters of degree, and those are matters that every state decides for itself. But Israel is the only country that is condemned uh, for um, uh, acting disproportionately. You know, the rule of proportionality and the rule of distinction between civilians and military are, are completely misunderstood by the media and the general public. Um, the rule of proportionality has nothing to do with how many soldiers die. If uh, an enemy of Israel kills one soldier, Israel is entitled to kill 10,000 uh, Hamas soldiers in, in response. There's nothing in international law that prevents that. Uh, the rule of proportionality only relates to the proportion of civilians whose lives or limbs are put in danger, and, and, and the, the putting them in danger has to be proportional to the value of the target, the military value of the target. That's what proportionality means. The distinction, the theory of distinction, um, is very difficult in the context of a war that's asymmetrical and that involves uh, terrorism. Who, after all, is a civilian? You know, the Hamas gives numbers. They give broad numbers of how many people are killed. But those numbers include Hamas members, Hamas fighters, people who helped build the tunnels, people who helped in other ways um, in, in organizing Hamas. And then the, the moral question occurs, 
What about the people we saw on the streets? Uh, the people who were cheering when a woman who was raped and beheaded, her bleeding body was carried through the streets and the crowds were cheering and cheering al-Akba. Or what about the father who got a call from his son saying, I just killed 10 Jews with my bare hands. And the father said, great, you'll be rewarded. I'm so proud of you for doing that. Uh, these may be legally entitled to the status of non-combatants, but morally, surely, they are different from children. So when you hear about civilians, you have to ask yourself hard questions. Uh, what level of civilianality are we talking about? I developed a, con a concept in my writing uh, called the continuum of civilianality. Obviously, at the extreme end of children and babies and people who are completely, completely, totally innocent. But closer to the other end are people who help Hamas, who support it financially, who support it militarily, who support it by helping to build the tunnels. And before you can make an assessment of civilian casualties, you have to look along that continuum and, and see how many belong on which end of the continuum. So um, right now, I think the heroes are, of course, the soldiers uh, in Israel that are fighting for the lives of their brothers and sisters. But other heroes are students on campus who are fighting their professors, who are fighting their deans, who are fighting their administrators. Here I'm gonna make a controversial statement that many of you will probably disagree with. One of the causes of the growing anti-Semitism on campus today is the uh, response to the George Floyd killing. Uh, the response to the George Floyd killing one human being, one man tragically killed by police, the police who kill him deserve to be punished, but one man loaded with drugs, loaded with um, a, a, a prior criminal record, one man caused a major reckoning at universities all over the world. Uh, admission standards changed, curriculum changed, bureaucracies, hundreds of people were put into bureaucracies. Um, ethnic studies, ethnic studies departments were were developed. Um, um, uh, uh, critical race theory departments were developed. Uh, this, these developments have really hurt universities tremendously. They have, first of all, watered down universities academically to a degree that many of them are not recognizable. But second of all, they have created a permanent cadre of anti-Semites on the campus. I'm not saying by any means that everybody who belongs to the ethnic studies departments or the diversity, um, uh, equity and inclusion uh, groups are anti-Semitic, but the largest number of anti-Semites, the largest number of Jew haters, the largest number of Israel haters come from these groups. If you look at the letters, the letter that was sent the other day by the ethnic studies department at a major university could have been written by Goebbels um, back in, in the 19... Uh, 30s and 1940s. So universities have to do a reckoning now. They did a reckoning after George Floyd. They've seen an enormous increase in anti-Semitism. Students don't feel safe. Donors are not contributing. And I have to tell you, I'm included among them. I'm a small donor, but I will never give a penny to Harvard, Yale, where I went to school, or Brooklyn College, or City University, where I went to school, until there is a reckoning with this growing anti-Semitism on campus. So the heroes are our students. And the few, the very small number of faculty, much too small, that are willing to stand up to their presidents and their deans and their uh, f fellow uh, uh, university uh, professors. And so uh, my purpose in being on this call is to encourage people in the academic community to fight back. Um, let's not be surprised that students are at the forefront and professors are at the forefront of this new anti-Semitism. Why is it not surprising? Students were at the forefront of bringing Hitler to power. They were the ones responsible for initial book burnings at University of Munich and University of Heidelberg and some of the great universities of the world. Uh, students helped bring the mullahs to power in Iran. Students helped bring Stalin uh, and, 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 and communists uh, uh, to power. Students and faculty have been among the most uh, guilty in terms of causing uh, terrible, terrible uh, ideologies to succeed uh, at universities and in governments today. So don't give students a pass. You know, there are many students now who signed on to these petitions saying it was all Israel's fault, Israel is genocidal, Hamas is wonderful, all that. 
Many students signed on to it. Now they're saying, we didn't know what we were signing. Would you accept that if a student submitted a plagiarized paper? Would you accept this as a defense? I didn't know what I was signing. These are adults. Some of them are 18, some of them are 19, some of them are 25, some of them are 28. They are adults and they have to be held accountable for what they have done. I have an op-ed that I just wrote today, an open letter to law firms saying, when you hire lawyers uh, and you have lawyers who are gonna be servicing your clients, you have to ask yourself the question, did these lawyers, did these law students personally engage in harassment of Jewish students on campus? Did they sign uh, petitions that said Israel was completely at fault? Did they then withdraw those petitions? Okay, that's relevant too. But accountability, the First Amendment requires a marketplace of ideas and the marketplace of ideas requires transparency. And what we're seeing on college campuses today is a clear, clear uh, discrimination against some viewpoints that can't be presented, but other viewpoints are presented. You have people speaking on college campuses today who are willing to defend Hamas's brutality. And in many college campuses, you cannot see a pro-Israel speaker, even a speaker like me, who supports the two-state solution, who believes in Palestinian rights, who considers myself as pro-Palestine, pro-Israel. I can't speak on college campuses for the most part today, but Norman Finkelstein, can, even though he said the other day, right after the day after the October 7th massacres, he said it warms his heart to see these, and I guess he was referring to the rapes, the beheadings, and the burning of children. It finally puts the arrogant Israelis in their place. So uh, I just wish you go from strength to strength, keep fighting. Uh, this is a permanent change. This is not temporary. This is not just the result of the October 7th uh, massacres. The October 7th massacres uncovered a deep, deep malignant anti-Semitism among the hard left and among the young on college campuses today. It is a permanent breach. It will never be healed. And we have to understand that and deal with it. And we have to fight back. In many ways, this is a zero-sum game. Um, supporters of Israel have been too willing to uh, support Black Lives Matter. Black lives do matter, but Black Lives Organization in Chicago doesn't believe that Jewish lives matter. And they were prepared the day after these massacres to put out a, a leaflet uh, glorifying, glorifying the, the murderers as students at George Washington University put lighted signs up on the building glorifying their martyrs. This is a zero sum game. There is right and there is wrong. We have enemies and we have friends. And we can no longer be friends with our enemies. We can no longer support them if they don't support us. Yes, support gay rights. I do. Support a woman's rights. Support all these rights. But do not support organizations that, as part of their support of gay rights and women's rights, oppose Israel. Do not support the organization Black Lives. Do not contribute to Human Rights Watch and other organizations that are biased against Israel. Know who your friends are, know who your enemies are, and make wise decisions about who to support and in what way to support them. And I can just tell you from a personal point of view, you can always count on my support. Uh, those of you who are on the right side of history, as so many of us are on the right side of history, need to support each other. So I'm there to help you and to support you, and may you go from strength to strength. Thank you very much, Alan. So let's open it up for questions uh, for Q&A. This was great. Um, any questions? Uh, Jonathan Berg. Alan, let me, let me say this. I, you know, what I'm in, entirely sympathetic to the view and feel very strongly that what the, what Hamas did was, was, was um, absolutely unacceptable at every level. I also think that your reaction is unfortunately makes the problem worse. It seems to me, I agree with you, that college campuses are completely off the charts. But the reason they're off the charts is the, one of the reasons, not the only reason, is the idea that you are right and you've got the moral high ground and the other side doesn't. And that is mm -hmm. 
ubiquitous on the, in, in universities and it's incredibly self-destructive. And it's so when I hear you doing that, what, what? Incredibly what? I missed your word. It's incredibly destructive. The idea that when you argue with somebody, you've got the moral high ground. They're a bad person for holding whatever view they're holding. Yeah, and that's so when true. I hear you say what you're saying, I see you falling into exactly the same trap. I agree with you. I agree with you. I completely take that responsibility. I think of this in a similar way I would think of the fight against uh, Nazism in the Second World War. We were right. They were wrong. We had the Harl Myro high ground. Uh, do you, you know what Mahatma Gandhi said to Martin Buber? Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who was a fervent racist, hated blacks, um, 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 just liked Aryans, and he considered Indians Aryans, a bad man, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, he was asked by Martin Buber to stand up in support of the Jews who were being killed. And he said, no, you don't need my support. Uh, you have the moral high ground. Therefore, you can lay down in front of tanks. And if you die, uh, you will be dying in the interests of, of a higher value. No, th that's not the way we do it. Uh, the fight against Nazism was a fight of good versus evil. The fight against Hamas is a fight of good versus evil. Um, Israel uh, 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 authorized the establishment of a Palestinian state in 1938, before it was even established, in 1948, in 1967, in 2000, in 2001, in 2005, in 2007, and there were even beginnings of uh, an expression toward that. Uh, during the last administration. The Palestinians have always said no. As Abi Ibn said, they don't know how to take yes for an answer. So yes, this is a one-sided issue, and I'm not going to compromise my morality in the interests of making uh, a, a more acceptable case to bigots on college campuses. I'm sticking to my high morality point. Sorry. I mean, all I'm telling you is the Black Lives Matter movement use exactly that argument. Who? Who did? What? You were complaining about the Black Lives Matter movement in Chicago. Well, but they're wrong and we're right. You know, no. there is. I mean, they, 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 they have the moral high ground. They tell you they have the moral high Not, ground and they, you well, can't argue with it. I can argue with it. and I do argue with it. They have the moral high ground on whether Black Lives Matter. They don't have the moral high ground on whether to send out a leaflet a glorifying terrorists. No, uh, they don't have the moral high ground where I'm not going to give it to them. I think too many people are prepared to compromise the moral high ground in an interest of trying to say, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, even President uh, 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 Biden, who I support strongly and I think has done a great job, has done a terrible disservice when in the same sentence he talks about anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim feelings. There is no anti-Muslim action today in the United States on college campuses. It does not exist. And it, it may make you feel better. And a lot of virtue pounding when you say, oh, on the one hand, we 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 deplore anti-Semitism on campus. And on the other hand, we deplore anti-Arab and anti-Muslim attitudes on campus. No, there is no anti-Muslim and anti-Arab attitudes on campus today. It is a non-problem. There is only one problem, and that's anti-Semitism. And it should be talked about with moral clarity, not with on the one hand, on the other hand. I spend my whole life on the one hand, on the other hand. That's what I do. Because 99% of the issues that I get involved in have two sides. This one does not. Sorry, I can't I can't give in to your well-intentioned point of view, but I think it requires compromise of, of morality, and I'm, I'm just not going to do it. Michael, <clears throat> you're muted. Pardon me, if I can go from the um, from the general and philosophical and uh, and foundational to something much more practical, do you have two or three suggestions on what you think will be most effective on campus? Yeah, but I can't get my way. If I had my way, I would abolish all ethnic studies departments. I would abolish all uh, critical black race studies departments. I would abolish these bureaucracies that want racial diversity, but not, not ideological or intellectual diversity and don't want equality, they want equity and don't want inclusion, they want exclusion of Jews. If I had my way, I would go back to universities teaching basic core courses and requiring that teachers 
don't tell students what they think or how to think, but have students taught how to think, not what to think. I can't do any of those things, obviously. I'm 85 years old. Even if I were 25 years old, I couldn't accomplish uh, all those. But I can tell you those would go a long way toward increasing um, the, the excellence of, of universities like Stanford and Harvard, which have fallen deeply, deeply, deeply into intellectual morasses. But what I think has to be done now in a practical sense is everything that's done for black students and minority students has to be done for Jewish students as well. If you have a dean for uh, anti-racist, you know, racist, you have to have a dean for anti-Semitism. Uh, if you have free speech that wouldn't tolerate the Ku Klux Klan or the Nazi party or people advocating lynching on campus, then you can't have free speech, particularly if you're a private university, for people who advocate the beheading and murder and rape of Jews. My preference is, of course, to have free speech for all, but we'll never do that. Uh, we live in a world of asymmetry where certain speech is preferred over other speech, where certain ideology is preferred over other ideology. So, you know, uh, look, we're, we're, we're fighting a losing battle. Look what's happening at major universities. Uh, people are being picked to be president based on, uh, on, on, on diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, many of them are incompetent. Uh, as my friend who was the president of three major universities put it recently, the one criteria that never exists for being a college president is courage. Uh, if you have courage, you're disqualified from being a college president. We have the wrong people in charge of universities today. And, um, and, and that's why donors are, are playing a very important role. And I support the donors who are playing this important role in cutting back on funding of universities unless and until there's some reckoning and some accountability. So I think that is something that uh, that maybe can be done. John. Um, thank you. That was that was stirring. Uh, one way of putting it is um, th there's this hilarious, oh, well, you believe in free speech, don't you? So we, we want to say kill the Jews, we get free speech. The hypocrisy of that is, is obvious. But I think that's, uh, you know, it's really not about free speech. The question is, at universities, why have we admitted, hired, promoted, uh, created such a political monoculture so that that people who come to who are at universities, given their free speech, choose to use it in this That's way, true. which leads to my question. Um, it is it is lovely to see the donor result uh, revolt, all the useful idiots, all the bien pensant who said, "Oh well, we'll go along with," are suddenly discovering, "Oh, you mean decolonization means killing all the Jews? Who would have thought?" Uh, mm -hmm. And they are waking up. The question is, will this signal uh, the end, uh, or at least a, a movement against the larger, let's call it woke ideological takeover of our institutions, or will the donors groups, uh, will everyone else be sort of like, there's a lot of Europeans after World War II who said, you know, the Nazis and fascists weren't so bad. They overdid it with the Jew business, but will we just sand off some of the superficial anti-Semitism and go back to business as usual? Or, or will people in general realize the whole project is rotten? Well, that depends on us and how we deal with it. Uh, if we deal with it the way my first questioner, who I admire and, and like, but who I disagree with, if we deal with it that way, that's exactly what's going to happen. If we say, well, there's right on both sides and let's um, make sure we contextualize and understand. Um, yeah, of course, what everything that Hamas did is terrible, 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 but no, there's no but. Uh, and so I, I think this is a moral crisis. Uh, I'm, as I said, 85 years old, I've been doing this. Uh, I started teaching at Harvard when I was 25. So it's 60 um, you know, years I've been doing this and it's never been worse. Um, uh, some of us saw it coming in, in, in my book, Chutzpah, which I wrote in 1990, I predicted this uh, coming from, I'm a person of the center left, but I saw this moving from the hard right where it still exists. The question is, not just, will they understand this issue the way we want to, but will they understand the broader issue? If these people are so completely wrong about this, hey, maybe they're wrong about everything else that they're uh, pushing as well. Well, I hope so, but it's hard. It's hard because they aren't wrong about everything else. That's the problem. As I've, I've written in, my, in one of my most recent books, the reason that the new McCarthyism is more dangerous than the old McCarthyism is the old McCarthyism was clearly wrong. It was going after the wrong people for the wrong things. But the new McCarthyites, the new wokes, they favor women's rights, so do we. They favor gay rights, so do we. They favor 
transgender rights. So do we. They favor climate control. So do we. They favor reasonable gun control. They favor a decent Supreme Court. They're on our side. They just are taking it to a point where tolerance has disappeared, due process has disappeared, free speech. Remember that the left, the hard left, never supported free speech. It was always free speech for me, but not for the. You go back to the, you know, the the ham, the the Frankfurt School, uh, and and the people there, they never tolerated anything like that. And so now the intolerant hard left is taking over. But the reason they're so hard to defeat is because they're on the right side of so many issues, whereas the hard right is not on the right side. We think the, they're, they're much easier the targets. Huh? Well, that's the interesting debate. Are they, in fact, is climate catastrophism uh, well, right on every I, issue? No, but is climate denial reason. of biology in the name of trans rights right on every issue? The, no, these, I agree with you. Trans rights are they, vitally important, but if we have to say there is no human biology to do it, that undermines trans rights. So I, I completely, the is they're I right completely, on every issue. But people like us who have centrist views that say, you know, you're right on the one hand, you're wrong on the other hand, as our first questioner said, they're few and far between. But I think the key point is to distinguish between areas where there is where there is calibration and nuance and where we should say on the one hand and on the other hand, like transgender issues. Uh, and this issue on which there are no two sides, I think. Uh, so that's the hard distinction. But I, I agree with you. This is part of a deeper and more pervasive problem that is destroying our universities, just destroying our universities. I so regret retiring at age 75 because I like a good fight. And um, the last 10 years, um, somebody said to me, one of the reasons Harvard has turned so anti-Semitic is that during the same year, Ruth Weiss and I left and we were among the strongest fighters against anti-Semitism. That misses the point. Uh, you know, it was always, it was there. Um, you know Harvard's history it's, and Stanford's history. They're all appalling. Uh, Harvard welcomed uh, Nazis in the 30s. They sent a delegation to Heidelberg University shortly after it fired all of its Jewish teachers. Uh, they had quotas. Stanford had a quota. Stanford had pretty much a zero quota for some of its years. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, but there was a period of time when things were very good, when things went well. And then it all turned around uh, after woke um, uh, uh, progressivism took over the universities. And so, you know, these the we have a bigger fight to fight. This is the canary in the mine shaft again. Amy. Unmute yourself, Amy. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, you know, I think what Hamas has done is not even debatable. It's just pure evil. I agree that, you know, on some level there are not two sides here. I'm 100% behind Israel on the one hand. But on the other hand, I'm something like a free speech absolutist. I call it being a Skokie free speech person. Sure. I mean, I really, uh, and, and the reason for that uh, is that I have been the target of all this talk about the other side having the moral high ground, being obviously correct, blah, blah, blah. I mean, what we have in the university today and in society is an attempt to delegitimate all conservative thinking as beyond the pale. So, you know, if you turn the tables, you have that problem. Now, how do you reconcile, you know, free speech a hard line on free speech with uh, being pro-Israel, the answer is you don't. And so what what has created this problem? I think the problem here is that we have something called licentious tolerance. Here I'm borrowing a phrase from Russell Kirk. Russell Kirk, and, and there is a strain in conservative thought along these lines, says in order to have open debate and free speech, you need a society that is not radically diverse in the sense that people share certain premises and commitments. And that is what we do not have in this country now because we have indulged in what I call a cult of diversity. We have allowed people in who do not believe in our way of life, are hostile to our way of life, are anti-Western, anti-democratic, anti-rights, 
anti-white. Uh, we have admitted them to our universities, all under the guise of favoring, uh, once again, this cult of diversity, which you know is inherently yeah. unstable. Yeah. And, and so I see the problem as being uh, located in our immigration policy, really. That's, that's where we have created an untenable situation. You cannot have open immigration, regardless of cultural background and commitments, and fundamental rights of dissent and free speech. You cannot have the two simultaneously. So, you know, now we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot. But, you know, let's remember that President Lowell of Harvard made a similar argument back in uh, 1915 when he said... I think he was right. Well, but he talked. He was talking about Jews. Uh, he was saying that Jews from Eastern Europe are not part of our culture. They don't have the same tradition of liberty, the same tradition of free speech. So we have to keep them out of our universities. My, my view is that uh, even if we were to cut all immigration off, we have a fifth column in this country. I'm going to make a statement now that will shock many of you. If they were, uh, the head of the uh, FBI recently said, just yesterday said, he thinks there'll be more domestic terrorism in the United States based on the model of Hamas. If there was more terrorism, not the 9-11 mega terrorism, but shooting up a synagogue, shooting up the schools, uh, as we've already seen some, I think there are students today at our universities, at your university, at my university, that will join the terrorists, that will actually sign up with the terrorists. I think there are students at Harvard University that would put on the green headbands and join Hamas in trying to kill Americans and kill Jews. I think that's how bad it has become. And yes, immigration is part of the problem, but it's only a part of the problem. But I wanna talk about your free speech question because I think you can have, uh, a, I'm a 100% Skokie fundamental free speech person and also a 100% pro-Israel uh, person. And I think they're compatible. And I think it's compatible if we create what I call the circle of civility or the circle of, mm. of freedom of speech. Uh, and the circle goes something like this. Oh. Alan, we lost. Oh. Alan, we lost your voice. Alan, sorry. Okay, you got me again. Alan yeah. is muted. Sorry. The same. The same rules have to apply uh, to the to the extremists on both sides. Uh, and if Stanford University, a private university, wants to say hate speech is not permissible, okay, I would disagree with it, but it would have a legal right to do that. But it would have to apply it equally to hate speech on both sides. It would never do that. It would never do that. It would apply it much more rigorously against Nazis and against the Ku Klux Klan. Can you imagine any school in the country today having 33 student groups blaming the black people of America on the lynching of Americans, it would not be acceptable. Schools would figure out ways of getting rid of those people who said that, but they won't figure out ways of doing it here. So I, I completely support free speech, but, but as an alternative for private universities, which aren't bound by the First Amendment, I demand a circle of civility where you can only ban things on one side if you can also ban it on the other side, and that's self-enforcing because the people on the left won't want their views to be banned. And so I think they will be less willing to see banning on the other side. But look, this is not an easy problem. And but Alan, no their ideology rules. doesn't agree with your basic premise of- I agree with you. So we, reject their, we reject their ideology, but I don't think we can do it through they immigration. reject our rejection. Or through admissions. I mean, let me let me put this question to you. It's a very difficult one. Let's assume you're on the admissions committee for undergraduate students, and you get students who apply with perfect scores and perfect this and perfect that and great recommendations, like this kid who was on the Harvard Law Review, Ibrahim uh, something or other, who participated in the harassment of Jewish students and who signed the statement, who probably has 100 jobs from major law firms. Would you discriminate in admissions to college against people who had ideologies that were inconsistent with free speech ideologies, democratic Western ideologies, or would you limit admission criteria to the standard qualifications of brain power, hard work, et cetera, et cetera? That to me is the hardest question. We've leaned over too much the other way. We take students today who don't meet the qualifications, the highest qualifications, 
based on left-wing perspectives, but we don't do it um, to get uh, ideological diversity, of course. Uh, but the implications of what you're saying is you would actually, in an admissions committee, turn down uh, students who are brilliant and creative and innovative if they supported an ideology which was against uh, freedom of speech, etc. That's where I think we might disagree. Lee? Well, I mean, one could make it, I, I don't want to uh, monopolize here, but one could make an argument there, there are certain basic, and conservatives have made, have made this argument in the past, there are certain basic commitments there are, that are necessary for a viable polity for our country to uh, continue in its current I agree. I agree, but would you enforce them I mean, to you, You're willing to make a judgment that Hamas's actions are beyond the pale, and yes. you know, we should be willing to make a judgment that certain fundamental commitments and premises are necessary uh, and desirable to be part of an institution like a private university. I'm, I'm not... Yes necessarily advocating for this because I know the tables can easily be turned with DIE sure. and all of these perversions. I mean, what what I've witnessed is if you don't if you don't uh, sign on to diversity and equity, then uh, you can't be part of this community. Right. That's right. That's right. right. And that, that's wrong. And I don't want to put it, I don't want to put the shoe on the other foot. But look, these are hard issues. They're not simple concerns. And just because concern, just because the left is doing it doesn't mean the center or the right should do it. This, you know, I wish we could have more seminars like this in universities with students discussing core issues like this. But, you know, you can't discuss issues like this because you're immediately branded as you have been and I have been in different contexts as subversive in some way. And that's just incompatible with the life of the university. I make one quick intervention here, which is, uh, Following up on either of these things, we ha we literally have now to private private first graders are being asked about their views about DEI in interviews to go to private schools. Yeah, K through twelve education isn't producing the pipeline it used to do, where there are enough students that have been exposed and thought about the kinds of things you're talking about. So yeah. I think it's going to be it's it's the problem really has to extend way down. Or uh, you know, because... I agree with you completely. Look, it was uh, it was uh, Lenin who said, I think, uh, "Give me the child until nine, and you can have him the rest of the time." Uh, there's no question that there are efforts to try to indoctrinate children at the youngest age. We took our daughter out of uh, the friend school um, for that reason. We we saw it being uh, an indoctrination. Um, then she went to Yale, and she was indoctrinated just as much, but she had the the ability in the world to resist it. Lee and then Nabil. Ivan, uh, could you put me on the list? I can't seem to get my hand up on this. Sure, thing. you'll go Rick, after Rick, Nabil. Rick, uh, okay. So, so first is Lee, then Nabil, and then Rick Schroeder. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, I worry that the fight that you're describing and related fights associated with culture and our economic system and politics, that we're going to be fighting these fights chronically. I and agree. I worry that um, that we just keep losing one generation of young people after another. Um, I've been teaching in the university system about 30 years. I teach economics. I notice large differences in the knowledge content of just basic history, civics, uh, understanding of political institutions when I look at undergraduate students today versus 30 years ago. I'd yep. appreciate any broad comments you might have based on your experience teaching at Harvard Law School for so long, whether you saw those. Because I, I agree with your, your, your thoughts about George Floyd being a sea change, but I think we planted a lot of these seeds a long time ago. So I'd appreciate any uh, any any ideas you might have about your experience teaching at Harvard uh, for, for so many years. I know I agree with you. Um, uh, look, when I started teaching in 1964, the students were much too docile. Uh, they came to class wearing a tie and a jacket. Uh, they came to class with their eyes open, their ears open and their mouth shut. Um, and they listened to me, a 25 year old Fisher uh, who had no law experience at all, but, you know, a pretty decent brain. They listened to me as if, you know, as if I was God. And it was rare to get a, a hard question from a student. 
Um, and then things changed in this in the 60s and 70s. And there was a period of time where a teacher couldn't say anything that was right. Uh, and 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 uh, and then there was a period of time which I thought of as a golden era, um, it, kind of the 80s and the early 90s, where the right balance had, I thought, been struck, where people like Larry Summers could be made presidents of universities for a short time, to be sure. Um, and you know the great cartoon that they ran, I think, in the Globe? It had Larry Summers begging the board of overseers of Harvard, please, please, you misinterpreted what I said. I didn't say that women were intellectually inferior. I said uh, Israel should be abolished. Now can I have my job back? Um, uh, so, uh, you know, that was even then, back then. But um, uh, look, education goes through trends. Um, many respects, it's better today than it was in the 60s. 60s were a time, uh, the early 60s when I started teaching, of, of docile acceptance of teaching from on high. And, and, and we had, we, at Harvard Law School, we had some really bad teachers and they were never questioned. And, um, uh, you know, how bad they were really, really emerged only after students started asking them hard questions and they couldn't read from their prepared notes that they had recited over the past 20 years without any changes. So, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not for the good old days. The good old days were not very good. Um, uh, this is a process, a process of change. It's moving right now in a in a, a very malignantly wrong direction. And the question is, can we move it back to a kind of a, a centrist approach? Uh, I, I don't know whether we can or not. I just don't know. You get a school like University of California at Berkeley and you get clubs at Berkeley, clubs at a public university, which say that the dean of the law school, this is at the Berkeley Law School, the dean of the law school cannot speak at any of these clubs because he's a Zionist. And the clubs amended their constitution to prevent any Zionist, no matter what they're talking about. They can be talking about women's rights, uh, but no Zionist is allowed to speak. And, and that gets tolerated at a university. So, you know, we're, we're in, a, in a very dangerous situation today, but I don't want to go back to the good old days either. Nabil? Yes. Uh, Professor Dershowitz, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. I would just want to say uh, my wife and I are big fans of uh, your YouTube show. Uh, we <laughs> watch it very regularly. And uh, uh, the, the main question I have is not directly the topic of the day, but very related, I think. So one of the advantages I have is that when there are flare-ups in the Middle East with Israel, I watch Arabic TV. And I can see the rhetoric on the other side, you know, the, and I know you are a big fan of the, uh, you're sorry, you're a big supporter of the two state solution. Yeah. And what I see and I hear from these sources, not to mention also people I know in the Middle East and so on. I don't, you know, I, I'm, especially with the recent events, I don't see this being or certainly it's putting questions. So I'm very curious about to know what you think about this and what is the path forward? Because this is, obviously this problem would have to be dealt with at some point. At one point. No, I agree with you. Look, somebody um, challenged me the other day and said, a lot of this is Israel's fault if they had just, um, you know, when the Oslo Accords, if they had pushed a little harder, if they had done this, if they had done that, if they had only not elected Netanyahu, if they had elected this guy or that guy, I have to tell you, I don't think anything would be different. Uh, they might be different with the Palestinian Authority, but not with Hamas. Hamas loves to have uh, unpopular Israeli uh, leaders, unpopular in the world, like like Netanyahu. They much prefer that to, um, you know, Bennett. Uh, Bennett, uh, you know, actually supports maybe a two-state solution. Look, mm -hmm. I think a two-state solution is a long way away because the only two-state solution that would be possible uh, would be one that didn't include Gaza as long as Hamas was there. Um, uh, you know, there are so many possible solutions. None of them are good ones. There's no good, perfect solution. If I could have my perfect solution, it would be to give the West Bank to Jordan and the Gaza Strip to Egypt and let Israel live in peace. But that's not going to happen. And so Israel is going to maintain responsibility for uh, the millions of people. Uh, people who want to destroy it. And again, let's just never believe the myth 
that this is a fight between Israel and Hamas, mm -hmm. not the Palestinian people. This is a fight between Israel and the Palestinian people. Yes. The Palestinian people support Hamas. They value Hamas. They honor Hamas. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want a two-state solution. They want a final solution. And so um, could Israel have done more to perhaps create uh, more potential uh, for support among Americans? Yeah, they could have done more. I don't think this event, this October 7th event, could have been prevented by any Israeli yeah. leader or any action that Israel did, um, except better intelligence and better planning and better responses. But I don't think any new good things by Israel would have prevented this. This is this is a war between people who want Israel destroyed and and and, and a diverse country. Talk about diversity, an intellectually diverse country uh, in which its citizens can't agree about anything except the survival of Israel. Thank you. Rick. Hello, Alan. Um, I wonder what you think of a consistent application of the University of Chicago's Calvin Institution of Neutrality Principle. I say consistent. The University of Chicago in the 1960s, when Leo Strauss and a dozen other faculty wanted the dean of the college to cancel an invitation extended to Lincoln Rockwell to speak at a dormitory, refused to do it. Um, they have been, they have been particular. I mean, this is like Skokie. And right from the beginning, William Rainey Harper announced in, in 1900 that the university as such will never be a disputant on either side of a public question and that individual faculty are free to take any position they want, but it should be understood as their personal position. And we've stuck with that almost consistently. Yeah. And I'm wondering yeah. how you feel about that as a policy for institutions. As yeah. Calvin said, we are, the institution is the sponsor of critic. It is not itself the critic. Okay? I, agree so, completely. I completely agree. Um, I have to tell you, Harry Calvin, who I knew, consulted right. with me uh, on and others on, on these issues. And um, Jeffrey Stone, uh, uh, who carried it forward in some ways, I am a 100% supporter of the Calvin approach, but Harvard, as as Larry Summers said, forfeited its ability to take that approach by taking such strong views. Now, but where the problem- but, 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 no, no, I understand where you're going, but let me say that it seems to me you are renouncing it to this extent. Once you say there is no other side to this story, you are basically removing a premise of the Calvin principle, which is that there is dispute and there are two sides of a story, no, and agree. we want to... I don't agree with that. I think there's no other side, but that no side should be represented as well. People have the right to represent a point of view that has no credibility whatsoever. My friend Monroe Friedman used to give a lecture every year at his university on why the earth is flat, and he would set out rules of evidence, and he was brilliant, and he could prove through, you know, sophistry that the earth is flat. Um, for me, the hardest question was presented to me by Stephen Jay Gould, my dear friend who I taught with for many years. Uh, mm -hmm. Stephen Jay Gould called me one day and said, I have a student who is the most brilliant applicant for our graduate program in evolutionary biology, except he believes that God created the Earth uh, 5,774 years ago. And you can't shake him from that belief. Uh, should I admit him? And I said, absolutely. And I want to have dinner with him immediately. Uh, okay. And he did, he did admit him. Now, I'm a 100% supporter of the university. Now, here's the one problem. Does that include, for example, affirmative action at the university? It doesn't, because the exclusion that Chicago has allowed is the school can take positions on issues that affect it directly. And the line, I'm not sure, maybe you can tell me the answer to this, did the University of Chicago sign on to the amicus brief in the affirmative action case demanding they that? Did, they, they did, and in my view, it was a violation of yeah. Calvin. Okay, so okay. you and I are on the same side. I think if you're going to have the Calvin principle, you cannot comment on the killing of George Floyd. You cannot right. comment on affirmative action. You cannot comment on Nazis marching through Skokie. It has to be Caesar's wife. You have to lean over backwards to make sure 
you are the, the, the forum. You are not, you know, you are Walter Cronkite. Of course, Walter Cronkite couldn't get a job today in the media, but uh, I agree with you. If you could have a University of Chicago principal actually 100% in force, that's the principle that I would completely support. Yes, let me just clarify one thing about what I just said. I actually do think when the university's mission itself is directly threatened, they have a right to take a position. My objection to the affirmative action amicus brief is that we have a principle set out by Edward Schills, which basically is the majority opinion in 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 um, in 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 the Supreme Court case. We basically yeah. say there shall be no consideration of race, gender, oh, well, I, and so forth. I'm, and, I'm, and it was, you know, and it, they could have taken the that position and it would have been consistent with policy. I agree with you. In fact, I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal saying that the decision uh, opposing race-based affirmative action right, would yeah. have been written unanimously, maybe eight to one, but either no more than that, by the 1964 Supreme Court on which I clerk, or the 1963, the height right. of the Warren Court, the most liberal court in history, would have taken the Douglas, the Bill Douglas position, saying right. race can never be considered in any governmental uh, action. So right. I think the hardest question, the hardest question, but I, I completely agree with you, and I think it's only a footnote, is how you define when the university's mission is involved, because the university today is defining its mission so broadly that right. it could include a response to George Floyd. Right. It could say, look, so many of our students are so distressed by what happened, we have to take a position. So you have to- But, really, but, wouldn't, really, but wouldn't, you, wouldn't you agree that the donors who were, th were threatening Harvard uh, or were gonna not uh, fund them, would, would, would stop being patrons are, are in fact, rejecting the Calvin principle. It's not inconsistency on Harvard's part that bothered them. They wanted them to substantively take a position and felt they ought to, even if they had been consistent in the past. I agree with you about most of the donors. I think there are a couple of donors, I have one in mind, who if the school had said, we're taking the Calvin position, would have continued to donate money. So, but I think you're right in general. The, the donors can be as result oriented as the students on the other side. So the school, if it really is gonna take the Calvin position, has to do it without regard to the donors, without regard to the students, without regard to the faculty, just be the umpire, balls and strikes. Thanks, thank you. Well, thank you all for your great questions. And uh, if there are no more, I gotta go back to finishing my book. Can I, on can I ask a question, Alan? Okay, sure. So I'm a graduate student here. I'm in the business school. And like you, I went undergrad at a CUNY school. I, I was at Queens. And uh, I did not see in all my time there, which included a bunch of glass of flare ups, didn't see anything near the kind of anti-Semitic and anti-Israel activism that I'm seeing here. Uh, I, I, with, a pop, with a student body that you would expect would be more explosive, you know, a large Muslim population, large Jewish population, Arab population, black population. So I'm trying to figure out what if, if, if my observation is correct, and I've been in touch now with people who are at Queens and Brooklyn and other places, it's nowhere near the level that we're seeing here at Harvard or other private institutions. I'm trying to figure out what, in your mind, is there a distinction between these elite institutions and the sort of the more working class universities that are, that's driving this kind of disparity? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I used to always tell my, I used to go and give lectures at Brooklyn College because I loved Brooklyn College. It it made me whatever I was. It really took me out of, uh, you know, Bro Borough Park and, and brought me to to Harvard. So I loved it. And I, and I would tell the students the difference when I gave a lecture at Brooklyn College, the students would sit at the edge of their seat like this and, and just eat up every word I said. The Harvard students would sit back and they'd say, all right, I'm paying a lot of money. Teach me. Maybe I'll listen. Um, and, and there was a little bit of that. I, I do think that's been overcome now. The New York City universities are now the worst of all the schools, much worse than Harvard, much worse than Penn, much worse than any of the other schools. Um, and, and the worst of the worst is the City University of New York Law School, uh, which is a third or fourth or fifth rate law school. But um, unanimously, the faculty unanimously, unanimously, not a single dissenting vote, unanimously supported boycotting Israel. 
um, and this was before any of this happened, and had a speaker at last year's graduation that, you know, really went over the line from anti-Zionism to anti-Semitism. And students I know at, at Brooklyn and at Hunter particularly, uh, and at New York University, I'm sorry, the, the CUNY Law School, are really scared. So I, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's an elite working class difference. I'm sure there are some differences. I think the working class students, you know, have no parachute. They have to get an education there or they're not going to get it at all. Whereas, you know, the elite students uh, have options. Um, but I, I think that it, it may have started at the elite schools, but it's certainly with a vengeance has translated to the to the public um, universities as well. Um, and it's a shame because the City University of New York was one of the great institutions uh, and it's uh, it's really gone downhill, unfortunately. And Larry, maybe, okay. maybe to, yeah. to bother you, if that's okay. So I want to go after the Calvin principal and Rick Schwieder's question once more. Um, what should Harvard do? I mean, as you pointed out, Harvard, I mean, by the way, great talk. I, I find myself in, in agreement. I, I, thanks for being here and saying all these all these things so forcefully. What in your mind should Harvard do now, given that they've gotten in a pickle and have stood up for this or that in the past? Should I mean, if they now come out and say, now, you know, we suddenly have a revelation, we believe in Calvin, we want to be neutral from here and forward. I mean, that would look like a cop-out, would it not? But on the other hand, if they take a position, then uh, would they be having to take positions forever? What would you do in that situation? Well, nothing good is going to happen because the president of Harvard was selected from the ethnic studies department. She is part of the problem, not part of the solution. And she is not going to adopt the Calvin principle because she doesn't believe in it. She believes the university should take her views and her positions. She's a very nice person. She's very bright very likable. And I had a talk with her just just before this happened, about a week before this happened, we talked about some of these issues. But her views on the merits are, I mean, she was picked because she comes from that bureaucracy. Um, you know, she was the person who fired uh, Ron Sullivan. Uh, Ron Sullivan was the first black professor, the first black professor who was the dean of one of Harvard colleges. And he represented Harvey Weinstein for two months. And as a result, the students in the house, a dozen of them, said they're scared to be in the same house with him and his wife because he represented Harvey Weinstein. He had previously represented the Boston uh, New England Patriots uh, tight end who had murdered two people. They didn't feel unsafe about that. And she was the one who fired him. <clears throat> and so I don't I don't think you can count on Harvard doing the right thing in the in the near future. Um, unless the alumni and, uh, you know, put enormous, she's now issued four statements um, following the events of October 7th. Uh, the first one was horrible and it caused an enormous amount of donor pushback. But even the last one, she refused to condemn the student groups, the 33 student groups that mm -hmm. had said that these rapes were the fault of, um, of Israel. Um, and so, and I think the four statements didn't represent subjective moral changes in her point of view. It reflected the degree of donor uh, pressure on her. So I, I'm not going to say I give up on Harvard because Harvard is a is an institution that is not only run by the president. When Larry Summers got elected, got made president, he called me in for a talk. And I said, look, you have to understand, Larry, uh, the students have the most free speech. The faculty have the second most free speech. The deans have a little bit of free speech and the president has no free speech. And he thanked me for that. He said, I wish I had listened. It was too little too late. And he, you know, he lost his job as a result of it. So, uh, you know, Harvard is a multidimensional institution, but don't count on help on the Calvin principle from the top. It's not, it's not going to happen. If it happens, it will happen as a last recourse because it would be perceived as the least worst answer to an otherwise impossible problem. Okay, we have a couple more questions, Stefan, sure. and then Randy. Those are the last. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Alan. Uh, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so one thing that I always wonder when, when I, I look at these events is um, it's sort of odd that Hamas, which is sort of an Islamo-fascist 
organization, which is clearly anti-Semitic and wants to exterminate Israel, is supported in the West by people who, you know, pushed transgender rights and, you know, things that are, are like completely incoherent, in, incoherent with uh, Hamas's agenda, yet they celebrate Hamas, Hamas's um, uh, killings of Israel. And <laughs> I really like something that you mentioned uh, in your talk, namely that <clears throat> the problem that we have here is something that was really brought to the forefront with the killings of, of George Floyd, namely, you know, that there is sort of a very radical wing uh, in the left uh, who who really is focused on this decolonization uh, as as sort of their their mental model. You know, I mean, they uh, I think that this is sort of where characterizing them as anti-Semitic is almost like, I mean, it's true that they hate Israel, but not in the traditional sense of anti-Semitism. Uh, it's rather sort of viewed through that decolonization, friends, right. family type lens, you know. And I think that to me is almost more scary because it, it means that if you look at the other statements that they make, they actually also look at white people in America as colonizers and right. peddlers and so on, you know. I mean, there's just so much hatred on that but part of the political spectrum. And I understand that, I mean, you're rightfully concerned that the Jews are now at the receiving end of that and it's appalling and horrible. But, you know, like today it could be the Jews, tomorrow it could be anybody else they feel is a colonialized. I, I, don't, agree, I don't agree with that. Let me tell you why. Uh, let's talk about two countries. Uh, let's start with Israel. Israel is the least colonialist country in the world. Who are they colonializing for? Certainly not Poland, Ukraine, and Russia. These were people who hated the countries they came to escape them. Uh, they were much like the people. In fact, Zionism started at the same time American immigration, political Zionism, at the same time American immigration started. There were pogroms in Europe. There were uh, the Dreyfus trial, all of that. Herzl said there's no future for Jews in Europe. So 10,000 Jews went to Palestine and a million Jews went to uh, America. They didn't come as colonialists. They didn't come on behalf of Great Britain or on behalf of any of the other countries. But there is a country that was established at just about the same time that Israel started to be established. It's called New Zealand. And New Zealand is the paradigm colonialist settler regime. Every single white person who came there came there as a result of Britain sending them there. They had no connections to the land. They ethnically cleansed New Zealand. They got rid of the Maoris. They, yeah, they had the treaty and all of that, but it was a fake treaty. And, um, and, and yet nobody ever reading Franz Fanon, which I always, assigned, I always assigned to my students starting in the 60s, because I, I saw this as an issue. Um, nobody ever focuses on New Zealand. They focus occasionally on America, because New Zealand is the most hypocritical country in the world. They criticize everybody except themselves. Uh, so, so I don't believe it's about decolonialization. I think it's about a certain kind of decolonialization, and, and Jews fit the paradigm they have to stretch it a lot to get the Jews in there because, you know, they, they didn't come as colonialists. They're not settlers. And and the opposition to Israel isn't to Israel within the 67 boundaries. Um, uh, uh, beyond the 67 boundaries, Israel to the 67 boundaries. I agree with you. If you take it to its logical conclusion, it includes America, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. But it's never taken to those. So it's not a logical thing. It's an emotional thing. And. That's why I think anti-Semitism is at the core. These people hate, I mean, look at Hamas supports honor killing. Uh, what are an honor killing? Honor killing is you kill the woman who disrespects her man. Uh, they kill gays, but they hate Jews even more than they like gays or like transgenders. There was a cartoon in the paper the other day. It had a man on a roof holding a sign, gays from Gaza. And then a Gazan comes over and pushes him off the roof and says unrequited love. Um, so, you know, there's no end to the hypocrisy, but I think decolonialization is yet another construct like intersectionality, which is often used as exactly as you put it, that it's not traditional anti-Semitism. If we can escape the trope of religious anti-Semitism, racial anti-Semitism, and introduce something called colonialism or intersectionality, then we can't be called Hitler Youth. 
And it's a good ploy, but I don't think it explains why such a heavy focus is on Israel. After all, every state in the Middle East was a colonial experiment. Jordan was invented by the Brits. Syria was invented by the French. Um, you know, these are all colonial enterprises. Um, settlers, who was the king of, uh, of, of Jordan? A Saudi who was transported. So there's no consistency there. Don't take the yeah. argument. Seriously, I think it's more like the concern that I have is more something that is directed against group that they view as privileged. And, you know, that could be Israel and Jews today, and it could be us, you well, know, tomorrow. Well, you know? Let, let I... me follow up on that. And this is going to sound a little bit self-serving, but I believe in this. One of the reasons, one of the, the, the causes that woke has is they're totally against meritocracy. Meritocracy is a filthy, dirty word. Who have been the biggest beneficiaries of meritocracy in the world? The Jews. They were without privilege, without any opportunities. They made it in America. On the basis of meritocracy, Israel became a scientific superpower, a military superpower. So Jews in Israel stand for meritocracy, stand for the ability to rise up. And that's exactly what the woke people don't like. So Jews fit that paradigm in so many different ways, colonialist, meritocracy, um, uh, rejection of identity politics. After all, Israel is one of the most diverse countries in the world. It has a significant black population, a very significant brown population. The majority of Israelis are not European by background. They're North African and, and Arab uh, countries by background, but meritocracy. And that's the bane, the bane of the woke progressive movement. Thank you, Alan. Do you have time for one more question? Sure, so we'll one more. Yeah. Okay, Randy. Thank you. And I wonder if you have any uh, thoughts on the influence of some countries like Qatar and the am amount of money that they donate yeah. to universities on what's going on now. Okay, great question. It, it turns out by complete coincidence, I am a friend of the Amir of, 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 of Qatar and his brother, but by some strange reason. They invited me, I gave lectures, at the universities there. I got to meet the emir's mother. I got to go uh, camel riding and horse riding with the emir and his brother. And then this is a strange story. When Trump became president, as you know, I'm myself personally anti-Trump, but I did defend him in his, in his um, uh, impeachment. And so one day he called me, it was July 4th. He said, you have to fly down to my hotel uh, in Baumeister in New Jersey. You're having dinner with the emir. He wants to have dinner with you, and I need you to persuade him not to stand in the way of our efforts, meaning, of course, the Abraham Accords and other peace efforts that were being made. So I flew down, and I sat with the emir and his brother for a long, long dinner. Of course, Trump interrupted consistently, saying, so, Alan, why don't your people vote for me? And I kept saying, uh, Mr. President, I don't have any people, and, you know, they vote the way they want to vote. But in any event, I got to know the Amir uh, fairly well and uh, went back to Qatar another time. And he invited me to the World Cup soccer. I, I didn't go, but uh, in any event, so I, I have a pretty good sense of who, who they are. They are absolutely over the charts, brilliant, off the charts, brilliant. They absolutely know how to play the role they play. Uh, I'm going to make a prediction here today. This is somebody I know well. I do not think he's going to be able to survive. I think in the end, somebody's going to get him because he's 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 too close to the fire. He's Icarus. Um, you know, he's too close to Hamas. He's too close to Iran. He's too close to America. He has budding relations with the Shin Bet and the um, and the uh, Mossad and Israel. Uh, it's such a balancing act. He's a very charming guy and he's bright, but uh, he plays every side against the middle. He has, you know, there's no ideology, there's no morality except survival. And uh, if he can help get the hostages out, it'd be fantastic. Um, and if he can't, you know, why does America have an airbase there? Why do we support him so much? If he can't help on the hostages, he's failed in that mission. Because right now, you know, they do support Hamas. He claims they only give humanitarian aid, but dollars are fungible. And so, um, um, I'm cautiously optimistic that maybe he can do the right thing, but um, my my cautious optimism is also bound by my pragmatism and knowing that he's not going to ever go too far in alienating Iran, alienating 
uh, Hamas alienating uh, anybody else. And of course, the one thing Iran wants is disability, di you know, this lack of stability. They don't want a stable area. They and and, and so they they use Qatar to credit, create instability. The United States uses Qatar to try to create stability. It, somebody should write a book about the Amir of Qatar sometime, of Qatar sometime. It'd be a fascinating study, and I could help. Uh -huh. Thank you, Alan. This was excellent. Thank you also for accepting our invitation on such well, a short notice. You guys are a great group. I always enjoy talking to you. I always learn something and uh, always get some good. I don't mean and any of my arguments. Please don't take them personally. Um, no. You know, I'm contentious by nature, so and I just we love were, a good argument. So thank you we for were, providing it. And just, just so you know, we want to organize a larger event on campus, and we would be very honored if you would join us. Uh, we'll, I would love we'll, to do it. I would love we'll to. Be on to touch. I've been banned from campuses all over the country. Uh, Harvard hasn't invited me back in 50 years. Uh, and when I was invited <laughs> back by Chabad to make a speech in defense of Israel, they had to move the speech off campus for fear of my physical safety. So um, the we are more open-minded than Harvard. Yeah, no, I, you are. I, and and the, I spoke at Liberty University a couple of years ago, and I said that that seemed more open-minded than Harvard, and that's a pretty low bar. Right. That's, that's so please, true. I'll come to Stanford. I'd love to do it. I spent a year at Stanford at the Center for Behavioral Sciences in 1970. I don't remember two or three uh -huh. before many of you were born. And I was uh, offered a professorship at Harvard Law School, at, at Stanford Law School, but I mistakenly chose Harvard instead. So sorry. Uh, but I'd love to come to Stanford to speak. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alan. And thank you, everyone. Thank you.